Coming up, we turn our spotlight on indigenous values and ideals that form the backbone of native communities and nations, and also serve as beacons to the rest of the world. Indigenous knowledges can impact and influence the way that we care for the earth. We'll look at how they are spreading in academic circles, through government to government agreements, and even through sports. The medicine of lacrosse does what it does. It brings people together in a good way, with a good mind and a good heart. Join us on this special edition of the ICT Newscast as we revisit some of the Native leaders we spoke with in 2023 who are helping protect, nurture, and spread Indigenous ideals. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. The ICT Newscast is sponsored by the Indian Land Tenure Foundation, a nonprofit organization serving American Indian nations and people in the recovery and control of their rightful homelands on the web at iltf.org. Support for the ICT Newscast with Aliyah Chavez comes from the Arizona PBS studios in Phoenix at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Arizona State University. We start in the desert southwest at Northern Arizona University in Yuma. There, the National Science Foundation has funded one of two outposts of its Centers for Braiding Indigenous Knowledges and Science. We caught up with Aura Marek Martinez there to hear more about this groundbreaking effort. Oh, the CBIX is what we're calling it for short. So Center for Braiding Indigenous Knowledges and Science um, really aims to be transformational by connecting or really by braiding indigenous knowledges and Western knowledges and more specifically sciences. We are really concerned about our environment and the impact of climate change on our homelands, on our indigenous homelands, but also across the world, right? We're seeing these impacts. Um, we're also concerned about the protection of our heritage places and our sacred places. Um, and finally, we are extremely concerned about our food system. So our water, our our land, right? And so the CBIX is really our attempt to reconcile these issues and address these issues with indigenous knowledges and, and by braiding these knowledges with Western science, scientific approaches. And so really we've seen... Um, you know, the, the development of Western science and um, the almost the total replacement of indigenous knowledges and indigenous sciences. And so what we're what we're really trying to do is create a place within Western educational institutions for indigenous knowledges to be able to show students how to do this, how to braid. Um, but also in, in bringing more Indigenous folks and in Indigenous communities into STEM work so that they are able to do this work on their own. So addressing climate change, um, protecting our sacred places, our heritage places, and protecting our water, our air, the earth, right? All of these systems that work together symbiotically to to provide for us, right? And so our NSF um, Science and Technology Center is really going to show or be able to create that pathway for us. This is the first time that this work has been completed within an educational system or structure. And so we're really excited about that because we know that our communities and our people have been doing this for thousands of years. That's why we're still here. And so really it's about bringing this knowledge into educational spaces and teaching and sharing and showing what our, our knowledges have done and have been able to do for since time immemorial, right? And, and really being able to address these three areas in a way that is collaborative, but is steeped in our own cultural understandings of the world um, 
but more importantly, being able to take that knowledge and and share it, translate it and share it out. So sharing out through, you know, our educational systems, but also in ways that we have always shared knowledge through storytelling, through song and prayer and dance. And so the way that we are going to share information is going to be in line with our traditional lines of cultural transmission. Um, and so really being able to indigenize the way that we do science, indigenizing how we share information out. Um, and I think that's one of the one of the major issues that underlies this um, lack of of indigenous perspectives and approaches in science anyway, in STEM, in STEM facing disciplines anyway, is um this practice of Western science and scientists to relegate indigenous knowledges to myth or superstition, um, and and believing that there is is not a scientific approach there. And like I said before, our people have been doing science. They have their own scientific approaches and methods that they have been utilizing since time immemorial. And so they know science. Science is a part of them. Um, and so, again, making space for that within Western institutions, within institutions of higher education. Um, but we're really hoping as well to make impacts to policy, um, policy at the federal level, at the state and local levels. Um, and really being able to see the way that indigenous knowledges can impact and influence the way that we care for the earth, right? Care for these, um, for our elements. It is the, the first uh, National Science Foundation Science and Technology Center grant that has been awarded to an indigenous facing project. And, and you know, this is something that Many of us as Indigenous scholars have been pushing for. I went to school for my PhD in the early 2000s and wrote um, a proposal to have my dissertation funded that looked at what would a Navajo facing archaeology look like um, and unfortunately wasn't funded because my work wasn't perceived as being scientific. There's this bias against Indigenous knowledges that has always existed, I think, since um, you know, looking historically, right, at the the way that Indigenous peoples, Native Americans have been characterized, um, studied, and identified by anthropologists and archaeologists, right? It, it, we've been perceived as sort of backwards or, or not having the intellectual capability of doing these things. And so that's something, a stereotype that has carried on and has impacted our ability to show to, to really demonstrate what we can do and what our knowledge knowledges are capable of. Um, and so again, this is, you know, uh, the first time I would say that NSF has supported something um, as indigenous as this. When we come back, we'll explore how indigenous ideals continue to percolate in government. Welcome back. Let's head north now to Wisconsin, where earlier this year I met a law professor applying indigenous values to his work drafting tribal constitutions. When I met with Richard Monette, I also learned that these ideals, these values, are relevant outside of tribal communities. But sir, you've done a lot of work building tribal constitutions. Uh, I want to start with an overview thought. Why is this important work? Oh, that's some of the most meaningful work in my lifetime for me, um, but it's of course meaningful for the tribes uh, as well. I do wanna make sure it's clear that uh, primarily I view myself as a technician, as a drafter, to write what they wanna write. 
you know, this is their basic document. This is how they want to create some of the balances in, in their cultures the way we all do. And so having a government that works is absolutely necessary. Is it fair to say that uh, forms of government have been imposed on tribes? Yeah, it's it's fair to say that. Um, forms, some structure, some of the institutions have been imposed. But we're seeing tribes getting back to understanding things like, you know, the separation of powers is not from Europe. It's ours. Um, you know, they had kings in Europe. You know, occasionally they put the king on the guillotine and lopped off his head. And I suppose separated powers. Um, but we always had separation of powers here. As one of the old natives uh, said to me, when the next tribe down the road came bounding over the horizon on horseback, a thousand strong, you know, we, we may have had a tribal council meeting uh, to declare war, but we didn't have another tribal council meeting to say charge. You know, some chief executive officers stood up and said charge uh, we've always recognized the functions of how society needs to work and we just uh, need to get back to the way we did it but I, also importantly just a, a little point here as we then talk about sort of separations of powers and we again get confined with the americanized way of thinking um, usually from schools educational brainwashing that we think about separation of powers in government one of the things that native societies taught and continue to teach apparently American society is that it's not just important what powers and functions you separate in government, but also what powers and functions you separate from government. And of course, you know, in our American society, we have the press that we try to keep separate. Uh, we have churches, religions that we try to keep separate. We have businesses that we try to keep separate. The American society seems to do that sort of in like random, you know, neurons or something. I have to quickly devolve into something. I don't know what I'm talking about here. Um, the difference is that that our indigenous societies have a tendency to think all that broadly and think about all that stuff, about how we have relationships between our tribes and our governments and our businesses and even some private businesses. But we think about what that relationship should be um, more. We think about the relationships with churches and religions probably more. That's an interesting concept. In the indigenous perspective, the powers are separated, institutions are separated, but the relationship remains. That's right. That's not a concept that's present in Western thought. It is not. And making and thinking about up front the balances, not only internally, as I said, within a government, but externally with the rest of our society, and even external beyond that to the societies around us. So... You know, we have a federal system here that works. And, you know, we have this constant debate about how much the Indian tribes contributed to that sort of thinking in the U.S. Constitution. But make no mistake again, just like they didn't have separations of powers in Europe, they had kings. They did not have um, federal systems in the way that evolved here immediately. Our societies were very much democratic, the kind of democracy that in their system they want to attribute to, to Greece, um, you know, the, the the birthplace of democracy, Athens, um, you know, almost sometimes I look at it and I think, well, it seemed like that was the beginning of the end of democracy in Europe. And when they came here uh, at the tail end of the Renaissance, they also found a renaissance of democracy in action among uh, indigenous peoples. And so to see that that external federalism relationship, not from the top down, but from the bottom up, is what made it work here and what makes it still work. And again, the primary difference is that even though our people don't you know, fancy themselves political you know, philosophers, um, we think about this stuff and we talk about it and we do it. So that concept, that those concepts are very important to start to get our, our, our hands back on and to get them into our constitutions and into our documents, into our laws again. Sir, it seems to me that you believe that those ideas deserve broader application. I think America and the world would do well to learn that fundamental aspect of what Indigenous people can bring to the table. That make sure the relationships are in place and that they are right. Make sure that the balance is working. Make sure that you recognize the imbalances and you counterbalance them. 
all towards some, you know, this romanticized sort of harmony that we talk about that, you know, those of us who lived it know is real. Absolutely. Sir, I've often thought that the Western jurisprudence approach of uh, looking for a winner and a loser in a given case is perhaps not the best approach, that maybe a better way of going about finding a solution that works is the indigenous peacemaking process. Right. I mean, just the, just the nomenclature, they call it an adversarial system, and they think that the best uh, result derives from that sort of adversarial system. And uh, it can, but it's unfortunate to look at it as adversarial because instead these adversaries are in fact in a certain kind of relationship, right? And they are counterbalancing each other. But your point is spot on that their objective seems to be that one's going to win and one is going to lose. And that's not the way we should even want it to occur, let alone whether it ever actually does. And, you know, we can teach it from our perspective, the indigenous perspective, that it's not about winning or losing for one of those or the other. It's about finding the proper balance between them. And you would think that after several thousand years of reading their history over and over, you know, they would figure out that um, it has never worked that way for them either. And at some point, um, everyone has to realize that the time is now to maybe have a look at the people who were the stewards of this entire uh, hemisphere and stewarding it quite well, in fact, uh, which is why they found it to be such a paradise uh, here, um, that it's time to listen uh, again and learn. Now let's follow the bouncing ball to the world of sports, where the game of lacrosse is going back to the Olympics for the 2028 games. It's a victory for the Haudenosaunee, the original players of the sport. It's also a victory for their medicine game. And as Rex Lyons told me, it's an opportunity to spread the Haudenosaunee tree of peace around the world. I spoke with Mr. Lyons in October, the day the International Olympic Committee announced lacrosse would be back in the games. Yeah, my name is Dehoi Dadi, which means he gets the message through. Sir, the message came through loud and clear yesterday. This is quite a day. It is. It's an extraordinary day for lacrosse, our gift to the world as the Haudenosaunee, the originators of the, the game of lacrosse. Um, it's a real day of celebration. You know, it's a medicine game first and foremost, and it's no surprise to us that it's taken such root around the world and people have embraced it and have now, you know, uh, just as much in, as uh, enthusiasm as we do for the game. And uh, like I said, it's it's, uh, it's an extraordinary day for the sport and for the Haudenosaunee uh, being the originators of the game. Uh, we, we were really in good spirits. Tell me more about your phrase, it's a medicine game. What does that mean, sir? Oh, when it was gifted uh, gifted to us by the Creator, it was first uh, first medicinal, you know, for the well, the, the the health and welfare of our our people, our nation, uh, our individuals. Uh, that that's what it was created for, as well as the, the you know the spirit and vitality of the nation, you know, uh, keeping our um, physical uh, conditioning up and those kinds of things. But it's a medicine game in uh, the ceremonial form and it also you know translated into the secular game now that we all the game that we all know and enjoy in, in its forms of you know the, the field lacrosse and the indoor game but it's all lacrosse no matter how you play it whatever the format is the stick and ball and the player the athletes um working in concert for common cause this is exciting to be able to take that deeper message that this is more than just a sport to the Olympics, to the to the biggest stage that we have as human beings. 
Yeah, it's extraordinary thinking thinking of uh, you know where we reside, uh, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, up in uh, central uh, New York and western northern New York, and as well as uh, uh, Ontario, Canada. It's, it's it's really kind of surreal to think that our game has grown, you know, so vastly, and and that everybody's really uh, taking such joy in it, and it's now gotten to the biggest uh, stage in the world, and. We celebrate that, and we, we really uh, are very excited about the, the potential of ourselves uh, uh, participating in the Olympics. Uh, talk to me about that. When you say ourselves participating, you're talking about the nation. Yeah, the Haudenosaunee Nationals. We're third in the world in the outdoor game, second in the world in the indoor game. Uh, you know, we, we are the best ambassadors for the game, and, and again, it's, it's our gift to the world, and we just want to... Uh, uh, help celebrate and participate and 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 you know be part of the the positivity that lacrosse is it's the great connector and and you don't have to look very far to see that the the world is in some uh in some very uncertain times and you know the medicine of lacrosse does what it does it brings people together in a good way with a good mind and a good heart and i think it's uh, very timely and there's no coincidence that that is being uh, brought to the world stage at this uh, this point in time. Your colleague mentioned the term peace through lacrosse. Absolutely. Uh, we always talk about it. You know, the Haudenosaunee, uh, our, our insignia, our sign uh, is the tree of peace, which symbolizes uh, all life. And, you know, working in, in, in concert and in harmony with all the rhythms of life, we understand this. And we uh, lacrosse is a, a vehicle uh, to this, you know, beliefs in, in our traditions and our values and our way of life and understanding that you have to uh, respect and protect all life, not just human beings, but all life. And lacrosse is one of the vehicles and platforms that we use to instruct our kids and instruct our people and and, and keep ourselves uh, in check as well. It's a great it's a great vehicle for discipline and, and self-awareness and those kinds of things that I think are so, so paramount in these times. What is the next step on getting the nationals recognized by the IOC? Well, you know, we have to uh, sit with the world across and, and see what their suggestions are and get a get an audience with the IOC because they will tell us uh, what they need from us. And and we have some tremendous support across the board. And we want to, you know, we, we don't want to steal anyone's thunder at this point in time. We want to celebrate that lacrosse is in. And that's kind of what we're rallying behind. But I would say probably not in the new dis distant future, We'll be meeting with uh, World Across, and we'll we'll lay out the the um, you know the, the footsteps of, of getting an audience with the IOC, and I'm sure they'll giving us they'll give us our, our marching orders and what they'll need from us in order for us to uh, have inclusion. And uh, I know they want us there. It just just a matter of what that looks like and how do we get there. Now let's go west to Oregon, where all nine tribes in the state have signed co-management packs with state wildlife officials. It's a way to bring indigenous knowledge and values into the crucial salmon habitat restoration efforts that the state had all but given up on. Back in the spring, I spoke with Coquel tribal members when they became the first tribe to enter one of these pacts. The Coquel tribe doesn't give up easily. In 1954, the federal government terminated it. In hopes that uh, we would just assimilate, just go away. And that was not something that our tribal members could accept. In 1989, Congress restored the tribe's status. Forty years later, another crisis. State officials said the salmon in the tribe's sacred Coquil River were dying off and they didn't have resources to stem it. They were talking about things like um, that these, these salmon, our salmon cousins, could be um, near extinction, and it was devastating for us. We just stepped back as a tribe, as a sovereign nation, and asked ourselves, what can we do? We knew that we had to come in as partners. The state of Oregon cannot fix the issues that are happening on the Coquille River without the Coquille Indian tribe. The tribe's push produced a landmark deal with the state to co-manage the fishery. Now, nearly a year old, there are signs of success. The goal that the state had established for collection was 150 total fall Chinook, 75 males, 75 females, or 75 pair. We delivered 150 pair of fall Chinook to the hatchery. 
with the tribal-led broodstock collection effort. It was an all-time record. Hard data on salmon returning to the river to spawn is still years away, but the state is pushing ahead, forging packs with other tribes. We've already got another one uh, with the Cow Creek Band of Umpqua Indians, uh, which is another coastal Oregon tribe. And we've been in discussions with a few other tribes um, in Western Oregon as well. However, belatedly, recognizing the need for indigenous leadership. I couldn't imagine how we would be able to um, exist as a nation of people without the our salmon cousins. We are salmon people, and we talk a lot about salmon, but it's it's a a healthy system that we are we are losing right now. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. For all the latest, go to ictnews.org. And from all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.